Good afternoon. Welcome back to another episode of the Lord of the Rings LCG Progression Series. And today it's a lore and quest guide for Foundations of Stone. So your journey has led you to a decrepit portion of the mines, untouched by a dwarven pick for many a year. The air grows thick with moisture and the walls almost appear to be weeping. If you recall in the last quest, The Long Dark, we're in Moria after the encounter with the Watcher in the water at the west gate of Moria. So far in this cycle we proceeded from Lorien located here up over the mountains up to Rivendell and then at the request of Elrond investigating Moria through the west gate after an encounter with the Watcher in the water. So, we have now made our way into a very deep portion of the mines. A low rumble sounds from below. There are a variety of underground waterways in Moria, but they should not be disturbed. Small rivers cut their way across your path. Some are not much more than a trickle and recent looking too. Another rumble shakes the walls. This time it seems to be above you. With a groan, the ground crumbles under your feet, the entire section of the tunnel giving way to a deep darkness and the rush of water. There is a feeling of weightlessness followed by the icy wet clutches of an underground river. The river has deposited you at and then there are a variety of quest fours where you can be deposited. And out of the depths, the shaft shoots upward the glimmering lines of mithril illuminating your way out of the depths of the mountain. The makeshift ladder is narrow, but you cannot linger in the realm of those things of darkness who gnaw at the roots of the world. So, the, this quest explores an area of Moria, Moria not covered except in. Uh, uh, it's referenced in the books. It is deep down in the depths underneath the mines of Moria. References made to nameless things. In the two towers, Gandalf tells Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas that he chased the Balrog through tunnels deep below Moria. He doesn't say who made the tunnels. And all he says about it is far, far below the deepest delving of the dwarves. The world is gnawed by nameless things. Even Sauron knows them not. They are older than he. Now I have walked there, but I will bring no report to darken the light of day. And it is in some of these tunnels, perhaps not as deep as the ones Gandalf chased the Balrog through. Who's to say? But it is down in the depths of Moria, that, below Moria, that this quest lies. So let's talk about the strategy, because this is a unique quest unlike any that we've seen so far in this progression series in that it has a secondary encounter deck which will come into play at a specified moment in the quest. So you start out as a fairly normal quest. You have the cave torch to assist in clearing dark locations. And you start out with one card from the encounter deck per player in the staging area. And the first quest only requires, the first phase of the quest only requires nine progress. Not so bad, really. Phase two, after you commit characters to the quest, you must discard the top two cards of your deck. So, as in many quests, it is important to get set up in phase one of this quest, because once you move to phase two, you're on a clock. If you, for example, advance through phase one before you're set up and then you take many turns like three or four turns to get through phase two because you're playing a relatively low willpower deck 
then you can end up discarding a lot of cards off the top of your deck. And you can end up running out of cards. I think I may have played this wrong in my playthrough. This says after a player commits characters to the quest, he must discard the top two cards of his deck. I think in my playthrough I played at two cards per character you commit. But I think it's probably just two cards collectively. But in any case, it gets a little bit harder in phase two to get set up because of this discarding cards when you commit characters. So you don't want to linger in this phase. If you're going to use a phase to set up, it'll be phase one where you're not being pressured to move on. When you get to phase three, you're going to encounter the gimmick of this quest. When you reveal this quest card, you discard all item, armor, weapon, and light cards, which means the Cave Torch is a light card, and then all item, armor, and weapons. So in phase one and two, you don't really want to play items or armor or weapons because they're just going to leave in phase three, and phase one and two are the easy part of this quest. After phase three is the hard part. So if you wanted, if you were going to use items, armor, or weapons for either or, You'd want to save them for after phase three. That's the harder part of the quest by far. So best not to play any of those in phase one, unless you really have to, to defeat phase one or two. And if that's the case, you're probably in trouble and not going to win. But there could be a comeback. After you've discarded all items, armor, weapons, and all encounter deck cards from play, you shuffle all enemy and treachery cards in the encounter discard pile together with the foundations of stone encounter, stack, encounter set. So whatever enemies or treacheries are in your discard pile, in this example, we would not take the location, but we would put treachery, enemy, and enemy in the secondary deck. And then you swap the secondary deck for the encounter deck. And that becomes your new encounter deck, and the old encounter deck is set aside out of play. This is a new mechanic in the game at this point, which we'll see with relative frequency throughout the life of the game. Then, starting with the first player, each player draws a random stage 4 quest card. So there are four in total, and each player will you'll separate from the group. Each player will be at their own staging area at a different stage four, selected randomly. In solo play, we select one randomly and the other three don't come into play. So let's take a look at the different phase four options. So once again, in multiplayer, if you're in a separate staging area, there are unique rules. Basically, if you're in a separate staging area, you cannot interact with other players in any way. You continue to resolve each phase of the game in turn order, but resolution of each phase occurs as if only, the, only you are playing the game. So each player, when you get to this point and the players separate, each player is now playing their own solo game and trying to complete their phase of the quest, and then you will all re reunite in stage 5 to finish. So let's take a look at the different stage 4s that are possible to get. They vary in difficulty. Let's start with the one that takes the most quest progress to complete, the Endless Caves. Takes 17 progress to complete, and when revealed, you discard all resources from your heroes. So you, yes, you have to make 17 progress, but the when revealed effect is relatively mild compared to some of the others, which can be, which can make it much harder. So the player at this phase, or if in a solo game you have selected stage four randomly, you discard all resources from your heroes and then you need to make 17 progress. And once you've made 17 progress, you advance to stage five if you are in a solo game. And if you are in a multiplayer game, you can join another player at the beginning of the travel phase so you will move to their staging area and then you can interact with that player 
as you are now in a duos game, a two-player game, in an attempt to complete whatever quest you are now at. So if, for example, you completed your Endless Caves and you chose to move on to help the player at Shivering Bank, you would then be two players versus the Shivering Bank, and should you complete that, then the two of you would move on to perhaps Sheltered Rocks, and then you would be three players against Sheltered Rocks, and then you would move on to help the player at Old One Layer, and then you would all move on together to Out of the Depths. Sheltered Rocks, when revealed, reveal two cards from the encounter deck and add, to, add them to your staging area. So you get two additional encounter cards to start, but you only have to make 11 progress. I'd consider that more difficult than the Endless Caves. The Shivering Bank, discard your hand and reveal two cards from the encounter deck and add them to your staging area. I'd consider that probably the hardest one because if you saved any items, armor, weapons in order to play them after phase three, now they're gone. Everything's gone. It's really, really hard to defeat stage or stage uh, 4B, the Shivering Bank, because no hand and two cards from the encounter deck means your setup needed to be really good before you went to Washed Away, because you're not going to have the chance to play anything new until you draw it and you're going to be top decking which means you know just randomly drawing one off the top of the deck each round perhaps more if you have card draw but I would consider the shivering bank to be the hardest of the phase fours you can get old one layer after the uh, reveal four cards from the encounter deck and add them to your staging area that seems pretty bad however it can be, but it can also be not that bad if you get like one or two duds. You only need five progress to complete and you don't have to discard any resources or your hand. So it's bad, but it's not as bad as Shivering Bank. Discarding your hand is, is the worst of them in my opinion. And then Sheltered Rocks is Endless Caves. Those are not really that bad. Old One Layer I would rank as the second most difficult with the revealing four cards from the encounter deck. With Sheltered Rocks and Endless Caves kind of more or less equivalent. Maybe Endless Caves would be the easiest and then Sheltered Rocks second. Once you complete, once all players in the game have completed their phase of stage four, it's important to note in a solo game, if you complete your stage four, you do not have to move on to the other stage fours. You simply move on to stage five once you complete your stage four. The text join another player at the beginning of the travel phase doesn't apply because there aren't any other players if you're in a solo game. And, and if you cannot join another player, all players continue on to stage five. So you don't have to beat all four stage fours, just one. And then you're on stage five. And stage five says, when revealed, reveal one card from the encounter deck per player and add it to staging. Each player cannot commit more allies to the quest than the number of heroes he's also committing to the quest. So you need 11 progress at that point. You may be bogged down by whatever enemies you still had remaining in stage four. So it's important to note that in stage three, all the encounter cards are discarded when you move into your own separate staging area, but once you move back into stage 5, the encounter cards that were left at the stage 4, if there were any, are transferred over to stage 5. If you have any enemies engaged with you, they will still be engaged with you. And if you had any cards in the staging area, they will still be in the staging area, just in the new Phase 5, the combined Phase 5, where all the players will be. So if each player completes their Stage 4, not dealing with enemies, they will all be now in the staging area or engaged with the group and will have to be dealt with because you have to make 11 progress. And you can only commit the same number of allies to the quest as heroes, so it prevents you from spamming the board with allies and winning the quest that way. So if your heroes have 
relatively low willpower, you won't be able to make up for it as much with allies as you normally would. However, once you defeat stage 5, you've won the game. So there are some unique challenges in the encounter cards to talk about in addition to the mechanics of the quest. We'll take a look first at the encounter deck that you start the game with. This one's pretty standard. Goblin enemies. We've seen this before from uh, Kaza Doom quests, from other Moria, the Long Dark, we've seen this. So there's nothing really new to talk about here. We've seen all this before, and it's pretty standard before you get to Washed Away. There are, however, some gimmicks to the secondary encounter deck, which we will play against after going past phase three. So let's take a look at the secondary encounter deck. In the secondary encounter deck, remember you have whatever enemies or treacheries were in the discard pile from phase one and two. And then, in addition, this thematically means they were washed down with you into the depths, and you may have to continue fighting them. The main gimmicks of Phase 2 are the objectives. You can have objectives, you can have a unique location, and you can have these nameless things which all have mechanics we haven't seen before in the game, so let's talk about them. The challenges and benefits. Talk about this mithril load as well. So, first the objectives. If one of these comes out, it surges. It's not guarded but it does surge and then if you like you can exhaust a hero to claim the objective and attach the objective to your hero. An attached hero will get plus three attack and if it's a dwarf it gets plus one willpower. That's Durin's axe. Durin's helm. Attached hero gets plus one shields. If attached hero is a dwarf it gets plus two hit points. So these can, if they emerge from the encounter deck, they can give you a little boost if you want them. In my playthroughs, I actually don't think I ever found it useful. I don't think I ever actually used one of these objectives. But it's kind of a neat gimmick, a neat thematic gimmick to the quest. We have the Drowned Treasury location. If it's the active location at the end of the quest phase, each player must discard one character he controls. That's each player at this staging area. It, the cards are only going to affect the players at the staging area. But that's a big deal. You don't want to move there unless you're sure you can clear it in one round so that it doesn't. Because you're going to move there during the travel phase and you want to clear it before the end of the next quest phase so you don't have to discard a character. And after it leaves play as an explored location, each player may draw two cards or claim one objective in, objective in play. And drawing two cards is likely what you're going to want to do, especially if you're at this shivering bank. This can really help you overcome that if you are there. Mithril Load. While it's the active location, it gains refresh action, exhaust a character you control a place, progress on the quest card equivalent to the exhausted character's willpower. So I guess in case you have a extra character at the end of a round, you can put some progress on the quest. It can be helpful if you're uncertain what's going to come out of the encounter deck and you save someone back to defend and then you don't end up needing that character. Nameless Things. After Nameless Things engages a player, attach the top two cards of that player's deck to it. It has health and attack equivalent to the cost of the attached cards. So if you've got a 5 and a 4 coming out of the deck, then this card is going to have 9 attack and 9 health. That can be a very big deal. In addition, there are encounter cards which will attach additional cards to the nameless thing in the event that you attempt to avoid it or tank its damage. Or in the case of the elder nameless thing, just leave it in staging. It can get buffer and buffer. And then should you be enforced to engage it at some point, it can be quite a problem. 
there's a large degree of variance in terms of how strong these enemies are going to be because of the large degree of variance in what cards can come out of your deck that you'll have to attach to this. If no cards are attached, X is 3, and the cards don't attach until it engages you. So while it's in staging, it's an easy snipe for Gandalf. Either sneak attack Gandalf or Gandalf. Or if you have anything else that does direct damage to the staging area, you can easily snipe a nameless thing. Well, not usually a nameless thing. This is usually going to engage because of its relatively low threat. But an elder nameless thing only has health 4 before it engages and then therefore it's a relatively easy snipe for Gandalf and I would recommend in this quest holding Gandalf in your hand until an Elder Nameless thing comes out because taking that out before it has a chance to attach top 3 cards of your deck to it is a very big deal these are very difficult to deal with if you can't snipe it with Gandalf in the staging area And they represent the major challenge, the Nameless Thing and the Elder Nameless Thing represent the major challenge of Stage 4. So, strategy for this quest, when we look at all parts of it. Phase 1, get set up knowing what's coming, which is the challenge of revealing two cards, revealing four cards, potentially discarding all your resources or potentially discarding your hand, and the challenge of having to deal with Elder Nameless things. It's a relatively small encounter deck that comes. It's not unlikely you'll have to deal with it. Typically in solo play you will unless you get lucky or you get through it very quickly, stage 4 very quickly. This is a long quest, so you can't take too long to get set up in phase one, but you got to set up a little bit so you can get phase two in one or two turns preferably and then be able to deal with an Elder Nameless thing once you get down to stage four in addition to whatever cards come off of the encounter deck and in addition to the challenge of potentially discarding your hand or all your resources. The good news is once you get past phase four, unless you're really running on fumes here, you're, you're going to win. But phase four is where the challenge lies, and that's what you're trying to set up for in phase one. So I enjoy this quest quite a bit. It's got new and interesting mechanics. It's one of my favorites. And hopefully this was helpful or at least entertaining. And thanks for watching.